Good morning. Coffee's working. <laughs> if you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And we've been talking about fish and ships in the Bible. Not fish and chips, although that sounds really, really good right now. We looked at the accounts of Jonah. Right? It's kind of a big fish story. <laughs> and we looked at the end of Acts, where Paul was in a shipwreck. So this brings me to a really important theological question about Noah. When Noah was on the ark, why did he not bother fishing? Because he only had two worms. <laughs> or maybe seven or 14. It's going to get worse, like just letting you know. It's, yeah. So I heard a story right, about a granddad and a grandson. Right, and they're fishing. They go fishing, and they're looking for bait. So digging around in the dirt, the grandson, he pulls up something like a millipede, one of those things with lots of legs. And the grandpa, well, he says, I'm sorry, son, that's not an earthworm. The grandson looks at him and says, well, then what planet's it from? <laughs> Speaking of fish, what kind of music do you listen to when you go fishing? Something catchy. On the internet, right? How do you catch a fish? Clickbait. Where, where do fish, you thought that was funny. Where do fish keep their money? In the river? Bank? Oh, it just gets worse and worse. I got more. I got some more here. Well, <laughs> what do you call a fish with no legs? A fish. It's just simply a fish. <laughs> All right, so two fish are in a tank. One fish says to the other fish, I'll drive. You shoot the guns. <laughs> Took you a second. All right. Did you hear about the brawl at the fish and chips shop? I hear that many fish were battered. Why did the dog jump off the ship? Because he thought he saw a cat fish. All right. Enough fish jokes. I'll scale back. <laughs> All right, perhaps you heard the phrase, I, I'm going to stop, <laughs> out of the pan, into the fire. Have you heard that phrase, out of the pan, into the fire? And it kind of goes way, way back, like old Greek kind of fable. There's a, it's about a rabbit on a ship. And so the rabbit is running away from a dog and decides to jump overboard only to be eaten by a sea dog. So a little bit of irony right there. So that's kind of where this idea begins. But then we get to the 1490s, and a fabulist writes about it. <clears throat> and it's about these fish in a frying pan, like boiling oil, and then they jump out. They're encouraged, hey, jump out, we'll get out of here, only to be burned on, like, the hot coals below, and, like, curse the person who came up with this idea. So the fabulist concludes, this fable warns us that when we are avoiding present dangers... We should not fall into even worse peril. And we'll look at that today. So, again, we've been following Paul through the book of Acts. Acts concluded, concluded with a shipwreck, right? So he survived the shipwreck. This week, we're going to look at two books written by a fisherman, Peter, the apostle Peter. So we're going to see here the theme we're going to be looking for what happens if we jump ship, if we go out of the pan into the fire? So one thing about these letters, you're going to hear a lot of redundancy, and this is going to be really important. So if you've been here for a long time, you're going to say, wow, didn't he just preach on that? Well, exactly. God's word is really redundant, especially when it's important. So you're going to hear like echoes of the teachings of Jesus, of Paul, right? Because the Bible, it's consistent. Right? So if we're reading it right, we're reading larger sections of it. Uh, it confirms itself and it's repetitive. Even within this letter, you're going to say, wait, didn't he read those verses again? It's important. It's repetitive because it's important. All right, so let's hop right in. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1. this letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. Very similar to Paul's openings, grace 
and peace. Really similar here. You see he uses the word obedience right up front. So that is setting the tone for all of us as we read it. Now remember last week, what was the theme of Jonah? Obedience. So brings that to mind. He talks about the hope of eternal life and really sets the stage here like this is what you should be focusing on. Then we get to 1 Peter 1.6. So be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. So let's put this together, right, with some of the other books of the Bible we've been looking at. We've looked at sufferings in the past. Really common theme. As Christians, we will suffer. We're going to have to deal with it. Here, we're seeing that Christians are being persecuted a little bit. So Peter's bringing them encouragement. But here's the thing. Stay on the ship, right? So don't jump overboard. So this is like what's on Peter's mind here. Don't give up, right? Why? This, this suffering, it's going to refine you, right? So whatever you're going through, these trials, they're going to refine you. Stick with it, right? So even though the storm can be rough, we need to ride it out to the destination here. And so this is what we have hope in. So Peter then transitions. Salvation. That's the big thing now. What? The good news. So he starts talking about that, then says 1 Peter 1.13, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. All your hope, not just like some of it. So you must live as God's there's that word again, obedient children. Don't slip back in your old ways of living and satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residence. So a lot here. Self-control and obedience. Already very big themes. Put all your hope in Jesus, as I said. Again, don't jump ship. You are temporary residents here. This is not your permanent home, right? So you are just on a ride. You're just passing through on a journey. Two things that you just don't really hear a lot in the mainstream church. Judgment. For Christians, as Christians, so maybe somebody has told you, ah, I'm a Christian, I won't be judged. Eh, wrong. We're going to see this come up again and again and again. I'll explain it to you. Fear. The Bible doesn't say fear not 365 times. Sorry. <laughs> like 80-something. Not even close. Right? It's mostly telling you, fear the Lord. Right? Have fear for him. So things you don't normally hear. Peter's on it. But we've seen this in other places. So he continues, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life right, you inherited from your ancestors. Or you can think of it as the empty life you used to live before being saved. Through, <clears throat> through Christ, you have come to trust in God. And you've placed your faith and hope in God because you raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. So there's the crux of it there. 1 Peter 1.23 for you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. So Peter begins to give you perspective here. Right? This temporary residence type of idea. The brevity of this life, like a flower, a piece of grass, just gone, right, versus your eternal life. That's what you have hope in. So what we may be suffering now is just very temporary in comparison, perspective. First Peter 2, 1. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you've had a taste of the Lord's 
kindness. Then he'll go into this concept of being like living stones for God's house. Kind of thinking we're, we're the body of Christ. We're living stones. But not just that. We're part of the royal priesthood. Right? So he's getting this thing. Like you are set apart from this world. You're holy. And so he begins to talk about Jesus being the stone that makes people stumble. The rock that makes them fall. And he clarifies they stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. 1 Peter 2.9. But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. He continues, we are royal priests. So he goes on to say, we, once we didn't have an identity as a people, now we have an identity as a people. That is in Christ. Right? We received his mercy. 1 Peter 2.11, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. So again, here's this concept, temporary residents. Interesting, these desires wage war against your very souls, very serious. So here's the thing, just to make sure we're clear about this. We are saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. But keep reading Ephesians 2. If you keep going past verse 8, you see we're created and new in Christ Jesus for good works. Important, right? So we should be living carefully around unbelievers because we witness best with our deeds. That's how, not with our mouths, with our deeds. That's our best witness. What does it say? They will see. It didn't say they will hear about your honor. They will see your honorable behavior, right? So we can, we can witness against the gospel or for it. It's our choice, but those deeds matter. And again, you see judgment again. And it won't be the last time. So this sets up the following. People don't like these verses. First Peter 2.13. For the Lord's sake, submit. To all human authority, whether the king is head of state or the officials he has appointed, for the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. <laughs> it is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God, again, and respect the king. So I'll put a little... A little bit of history on this. <laughs> so, A, like a lot, I've heard this before, like it's the translation he's reading. No, I've read this in the Greek. Pretty good. The NLT actually kind of nails this. It means king, Basileia. So it's talking about literally not church leaders or anything like that, which they're included here, but no, government leaders. And back then, it's either soon to be Nero or it is Nero at this time, who what? Burned Christians alive. And this is what Peter writes. You respect them. Why? What is it talking about? Well, we witness with our deeds. Many people were won over to the faith by observing the actions of the martyrs, the early martyrs. So, <clears throat> honorable behavior. Now you see the verses around it. What's it all about, right? Silence them with what? By arguing with them. <laughs> Wrong. With your deeds. Actions speak louder than words, right? Your honorable behavior. And so we'll get to this now, especially in this next section. He talks about being a slave of God, and you're slaves of God. It's not about racism. It's about commerce more back then. But in this context, it's about being completely joined to God, right? So you are completely committed to him. Again, did you notice? Fear God. That comes up again. So now when I say slaves uh, and masters, you can think in today's context like employers, employees. First uh, Peter 2.8. You who are slaves must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you to do. Not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. For God is pleased when, conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned nor deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when insulted nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. 
He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you've turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your soul. So again, the slavery, th think of it like employees, employers for the context today uh, for application. Uh, you, you, if you go to Ephesians and Colossians, Paul kind of spends a little more time there and balances that out. Like masters, you serve the same God too. Watch out. Right? So gives a little warning there. Patiently endure unjust treatment, even when it's not fair. Just like Jesus. We're supposed to be like him, right? He is our, what does it say? Example. He didn't retaliate, deceive, seek revenge, repay insult for insult, none of that. So again, this thing about like, you know, being these lost sheep. Now we have a shepherd. So it's like that once you had no identity, but now you're a people, you're a holy priesthood. First Peter 3, 1, in the same way, <laughs> you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then even if some of you refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. So now this makes a lot of sense, right? Actions. Maybe your husband's not a believer. How do you win him over? By screaming at him? <laughs> no, 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 no. Telling him what to do? No. Just your behavior. Why is she so nice, right? Even if I'm not. They might ask the question. So, again, this is like Ephesians and Colossians. It's very, very similar. Um, so it goes, in, <laughs> it goes into some other verses. Don't be concerned about outward beauty and fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, and beautiful clothes. <laughs> okay, and some more stuff. So anyway, <laughs> it talks about Sarah obeying her husband, right? So, and this is where a lot of guys, especially in really conservative churches, not that we're not conservative, but they like to stop. Right? You know, and like, <laughs> woman, you know, that kind of thing. Right? That's not what I do. I don't, I'm just, it was an example. <laughs> so, but here's the way you got to keep reading, guys. Ready? We'll keep going. First Peter 3, 7. In the same way. The what way? Same way. You husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you. Oh, you are, but she's your equal partner in God's gift to a new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. What? Think about that one for a second. Hold on. Can your prayers be hindered? Apparently so. <laughs> That's right. They can't. <laughs> right? Get a little nudge. A little hubby. I, don't, I didn't see that, but anyway. <laughs> so Isaiah 1, Amos 5. It's all over the Bible. But people don't like reading it. It's all over the Bible. There are times when God is not listening to you. In the context of Amos 5 and Isaiah, it's the same type of thing. Take away the noise of your songs. I want justice. I want right living. I don't want to hear lip service. That's what it's all about. Your prayers can be hindered. So it goes into all Christians. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. I like that. Sympathize with each other. How often do we criticize other Christians without putting ourselves in their shoes? Hmm. Now, if you didn't believe what I said about God not listening, you should read your Bible. Or you can just listen to me. 1 Peter 3, 9. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Did we just hear this? It sounds like it, right? Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God called you to do, and he will grant you a blessing. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and maintain it, right? Work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Oh, it's kind of redundant, isn't it? Again, don't retaliate, bless people, or it sounds like Romans 12, it's all over the Bible, and search for peace, right? So, 1 Peter uh, 3.13, again, you're going to hear suffering here. Now, who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see. Right? See what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it's better to suffer for doing good, if that's what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. So here's the suffering thing. But what? 
If that's what God wants, remember the refining? That again. Uh, so in this, you, you may have a version that like, talks about to be ready to make a defense for what you believe. So this version is making that easy to understand. So it's apologia, right? apologetics, to make a defense. That's where this word comes from when we talk about apologetics. But did you notice something so when they see what you do? Did you notice something else? You, be prepared to, 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 to tell people about what you believe. But how? Gently. Not like I just said it. Gently. Kind. Be kind and gentle. Peter's careful to put that in there, right? And did you read everything he wrote before? About being peaceful, not insulting people, not insulting anyone or being argumentative with gentleness. So, I mean, honestly, I see even a lot of like PhDs and all these people, they get up and they're so smart, they're stupid. Like they don't just read this. Right? So they start arguing and engaging. You ever see people in the street evangelists like screaming and yelling? People with picket signs. It's all disobedient to the word of God. Not how we're supposed to be doing it. We're supposed to be doing it kindly, gently, right? Not this blanket, you know, you know, whatever, Instagram evangelism to make yourself look holy. No. <laughs> right? We're supposed to be home. Buy him a cup of coffee. What does it say? Sympathize. Sympathize with others. Okay, just so we're clear, we'll continue. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners. Now here's an idea, to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but was raised to life in the spirit. Now, think about Noah, who was brought to safety in an ark. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God patiently waited while Noah was building his ark. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you get this picture, right, of being saved in an ark, like carried away to safety like Noah and his family was, right? So don't jump ship. We're going to keep this in mind and we'll get there. 1 Peter 4.1, so then. Since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had. The same. And be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you'll be anxious to do the will of God. You've had enough in the past of the evil things that the godless people enjoy, their morality and their lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties and their terrible worship of idols. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So they slander you. But remember, they will have to face God who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. That is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they live forever with God in the Spirit. So some people kind of get lost in this text, but let's just keep the point in mind. We can talk about more of it at Bible study. So there are a few things here, right? You're dead to sin. That's a big thing. Philippians 2, it sounds a lot like that, right? Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, right? Have the same attitude as Jesus. Be like him. Now, we've talked about in the past, too, these toxic relationships, right, that we might have to jump ship on, right? So you, you're going to have haters, right? When you enter Christianity, you decide you want to better yourself. You, whatever it is that you're, you're working on, you get better. You don't want to engage in the stuff that they do anymore. They're going to hate. They're going to slander you, right? But they are on a sinking ship. Right? You are on something solid. So let them laugh whatever, right, as they go over that waterfall. Again, judgment. It's getting redundant in here, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so here's a thought. The end of the world is coming soon, he says. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Again, you need to love each other. He talks about a variety of spiritual gifts, much like Romans 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, right? But these gifts are not there so that you can be puffed up in them and brag about it. These gifts are there so that you can use them to minister to others. You can serve others effectively with them. What did he just say? Love, right? So that's the best thing. And that's what he does there in uh, Romans 12 to Romans 13, the, tr the transition. Talks about all the spiritual gifts. And then he's like, wait, let me show you something that's greatest of all. Love, the chapter you heard at a wedding, right? So there we go. Verse Peter 4.12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials. 
you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to the whole world. If you're insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. For the time has come for judgment. And it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So, if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. So, fiery trials. Right, so, here we go with the Nero stuff. But don't jump out of the pan and into the fire. This refines you. This is the refining process. You are to be partners in Christ's sufferings. Again, sounds a lot like Philippians to me. Interesting concept. God is pleased when you suffer? So this shot a hole in the boat of the prosperity gospel, didn't it? Yeah. It doesn't sound anything like mainstream Christianity, does it? Not really. But mainstream Christianity has adopted a lot of the world, not a whole lot of the word. Right? So if you're sitting there going, I don't normally hear this many scriptures in church, that's too bad. That's too bad. I'd rather hear more of God, right? My fish jokes are pretty good, though. <laughs> right? So that's how I soften you up a little bit for this. But what makes more sense? Like, I have a better thing to say than this. No, I don't. All right, so I'll continue. Oh, did you notice gossip's a sin? Okay. <laughs> First Peter 5. So Peter talks about being <laughs> a fellow elder, right? So he's giving some encouragement. He's basically saying, uh, as we get into chapter 5, don't uh, run the church grudgingly. Don't run it for money, right? Do it out of love. Love the flock and give some uh, advice to younger people there that they must, you know, accept the authority. But the main thing here, a lot of younger leaders especially, um, they, they lack humility sometimes, right? They can be prideful. So that's kind of the encouragement he's giving here. And, you know, he warns about sin. First Peter 5, 8, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you've suffered for a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. Maybe you're getting like the end of the Sermon on the Mountain mind here, right? That solid rock, the bedrock of Christ. All power to him forever and ever. Amen. So we get to the close of uh, First Peter. He talks about Silas, member Silvanus, that traveled with Paul. He's penning the, level, the letter. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter's probably dictating it, right? So Silvanus is writing it. My purpose in writing this, though, is to encourage you and to assure you that what you're experiencing is truly a part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in his grace. So, so whatever you're going through, it's part of God's grace for you. Interesting. What did Paul, get the thorn out of my side. Second Corinthians 12. Get the thorn out of my grace is sufficient for you. Right? So here's that thinking. It comes together. He makes a mention of Babylon. We're going to get into Revelation in a couple of weeks here, a few weeks. Uh, Babylon is code uh, for Rome. That, that, that's what that is. So he's probably writing from Rome. Uh, peace be with all of you who are in Christ. Let's hop right into 2 Peter. It's much shorter, and then we'll get to the application. 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Similar opening, right? What's the tone again? Grace and peace, grace and peace, over and over again. The slave thing, we talked about it already, you understand that. Jesus is God. There are many out there who deny the deity of Jesus as one of the first heresies, right? Arian heresy, if you know your history, right? Right here, here's your, mark this in your Bible, Jesus is God. We talked about this in a lot of different places, it's in Titus as well. It's all over the Bible, right? So Jesus is God. But there are many trying to deny that 
even today. He's a God or something else. No, he is the God. He is God. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. His promises, they're his promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desire. So now he's building to you're escaping it, right? So you're rescued from it. You are carried from it. So remember that imagery. It's going to come up again. Second Peter 1.5. In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. What is that word again? And self-control with patient endurance. And patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. Dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you are really among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's promises require a response. God's promises require a response. Now, remember the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, goodness, right? So <clears throat> though all those things, it's kind of packed right in here. It's a similar type of thing. Self-control again. Uh, work hard to prove what? That you're a Christian. That's interesting. So paying attention to Scripture. So Peter gets to something here. I'll always remind you about these things. It's only right that I should keep reminding you as long as, like, I'm still alive, right? For the Lord Jesus Christ has shown me, is Peter, talking, I must leave, soon leave this earthly life. Where is tent there? I'll explain that in a second. So <clears throat> uh, work hard that you always remember these things, right? So it's like uh, 2 Corinthians 5 when Paul talks about packing up the earthly tent. Remember that temporary residence thing? This is not our home. Our home is not here. He refers to the body itself as an earthly tent. It's time to pack it up put it away, we're going to go get those new heavenly bodies. So that's where he's going here. So Peter is probably uh, at the end of his life, and he's about to get crucified upside down uh, because that's what history records him as doing because he's not worthy of being crucified like Jesus was. Turn me upside down. Wow. So you must pay close attention to what they are. He's talking about the prophets and all the scriptures. Pay attention. And so the words of scripture are like a lamp in a very dark place. 2 Peter 2, 1. But there are also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who brought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality, and because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be Delayed. So remember this concept in Titus where you can slander the gospel with what? Your actions, right? So that's important. False teachers, what's the telltale sign? They're after your money. So if I'm up here saying I need a new private jet, right? <laughs> your question would be why do you have a private jet in the first place? Like what do you need that for? All right, so if I'm being greedy and trying to get a lot of money, not for the church for myself, then I would be a false teacher, right? So they're automatically disqualified. A lot of people like that. Well, what he does is with his money is his business. And no, 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 no. That's not what God's word says. So it's okay. Timothy, what do we see? Pay the teacher like double honor, right? They're worthy of double honor, right? Some say, okay, double. But not like a hundred times what everybody's making, right? And for greedy purposes. Paul says, tell the rich, right, to be generous. But you and I, we're good with food and clothing. So as pastors, we should all be working in ourselves in that direction, getting ready to fold up that tent. That's, not, that's the right mindset there. So Noah highlight again. For God did not even spare the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world except Noah and the seven others of his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. God protected Noah when he destroyed the world and the ungodly people in the flood. So we have that again, but he, we know he's carried to safety. He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, but Lot was saved. So all these examples of people being destroyed in judgment and then some being saved, right? 
So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the final day of judgment. See that theme again. You in Christ will be rescued, carried away, whatever the picture. And so he's trying to, like Lot, create this picture of people who are saved because of their faith and people who are judged and doomed. He talks about characteristics of false teachers, right? So he's especially, and this is really interesting, he's especially hard on, right, those <clears throat> who have a twisted sexual desire. And there's something else here, too, that's interesting. And those who despise authority, it's right up there, so verse 10, right, right up there with that. Careful, right? These people, why? They're proud and arrogant, even daring to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. I'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, on false teachers, he likens false teachers. You remember Balaam and his donkey? I know you do. But Balaam and the donkey, so he likens false teachers to that. These people are as useless as dried up springs or as mist blown away by the wind. They are doomed to the blackest darkness. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. Mm, you are a slave to whatever controls you. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved again, they're worse off than before. Don't jump ship. Don't jump ship. You have escaped. You are being rescued. But it says, and he gives it, there's a truth to the proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit in the Proverbs, and he adds, and a washed pig returns to the mud. Don't jump ship. 2 Peter 3.1, he basically is saying here, most importantly, I want to remind you, in the last days there will be scoffers that will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. Sounds a lot like what Paul wrote to Timothy, correct? Almost verbatim. It's really close. Right, so they're being kept for the day of judgment when, on, when godly people will be destroyed. And here's the thing that starts coming to mind, right? Okay, so why does this seem to take so long to see the justice? I want it now. I want the justice now. I want the sufferings to be over now. Why? Why do I have to go through this? What's going on? Why is the Lord being slow? Question answered, 2 Peter 3.8. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will, found, will be found to deserve judgment. And there it is again. So, uh, cancel the earth. Earth Day field trip, right? So that's not... <laughs> what we perceive as going very slowly is like nothing to the Lord. And he wants to give you a chance in case you haven't gotten on board yet, right? And others too. But again, the earth, everything, all our material stuff will be destroyed. The earth itself will be destroyed. That's the biblical mindset. Right? So you get this prosperity thing, they stop, like a Noah, right? You know, oh, did you see? Be fruitful and multiply. That's why he told Noah. When we didn't just get off an ark and it flood the whole, that's everyone's dead. We have to repopulate, <laughs> right? This is not what the New Testament says. Paul, 1 Corinthians 7, if you don't believe me, right? Better everybody's like me and you don't get married. Right? You want to focus all your attention on that. There's no sin to get married, and it's clear there. But if you can be without it, just focus on the Lord. Totally different, right, than the whole prosperity thing. The whole earth will be destroyed. It is not permanent. There's not a permanent home for anyone, and all your stuff, too. It's all going to be gone. So where's our focus, right? So 2 Peter 3.11, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to what? The day of God and hurrying along. And lunch today. That's not in there. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. He wants to make sure you understand this. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he's promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. I'll pause right there. Unlike today's world. So if you're like, I want the righteousness, I want the justice, I want change. It ain't happening now or here. It's not. So you get all these advocates for change, and we're going to change the world by whatever, electing all these people. No, you're not, because you're not God. You need to pay attention. God tells us how it's going down. It's not going to happen like that. All this stuff is going to be destroyed. 
What? The new heavens, the new earth, Jesus' kingdom. And this is not it. He was very clear about that. So important mindset. But we are looking forward to what? The new heavens, the new earthy promise, and a world filled with God's righteousness. It's not here. It's there. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting, what do we do? Waiting for these things to happen. Make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in God's sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. Speaking of these things in all of his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand. And those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of Scripture. And this will result in their destruction. So again, you got the perspective, I hope. Right? This is not our permanent home. Our focus, can we have, have some nice things? Can we enjoy it here while we're waiting on the line for the real ride or whatever analogy you want? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we can have some nice things. We can enjoy this, right? So I think laughter is a good thing. It says to have joy. All that's fine. But this is really not where your focus should be. And the Word of God is very clear about that, right? So we're focused on a better world. Now, uh, Paul's letters are scriptures. Here you see that confirmed. And it is confusing. So what should we do? Oversimplify it and twist it? No. We should dig in, right? Get yourself a teacher who knows the Greek, who can kind of like understand it, and then explain it to you in words that are easy to understand. Don't dismiss it. Don't twist it. Don't oversimplify it, right? We're supposed to be knowledgeable and wise as Christians. Peter's final words. So you already know these things, dear friends, so be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people. So false teachers is a really big deal, right? And lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you get that carried away theme again. Seeing that picture he's painting for you of us being carried away on this ark to our new heavenly home. And again, false teachers is a really big thing. And we've seen this. If you've been with us for a while, you're like, man, it talks a lot about false teachers. Jesus even warns about false teachers. So, in the end time. so what? But you don't hear a lot about that in the modern church, do you? Why? I'll tell you why. If you don't call me out, I won't call you. <laughs> there are a lot of unspoken agreements in church world. When you don't play nice, you get phone calls. But then I don't really care <laughs> who likes me or not. But anyway, you know, don't call me out. I won't call you out. That's, that's what the false prophets say, right? So, yeah. All glory to him, both now and forever and ever. Amen. So do not be carried away. Do not be swept away by this flood, right? By the evil. Stay on board right, of this ark that we see Peter paints a picture of. So we saw Paul survived a shipwreck. Right? And remember what was going on there. That present ship you know, was going to be destroyed, but it was carrying him to the destination. It was very interesting because what did they do? They tried to let down the lifeboat. He's like, nope, we all stay on or we die. So even though the storm was rough, he's like, nope, we need to ride this out because this ship is getting me to my destination. And it doesn't matter how bad it is. This picture here, right? These fiery trout. Doesn't matter. Don't jump out of the pan and into the fire. You got to stay with it. It's refining you. So we can apply this to so many things in our lives that we do, right? You know, like working out is an obvious one. No pain, no gain. You know, that type of thing. And that's the picture we're supposed to get. In contrast, we call Jonah, right? <laughs> Throw me overboard, right? He kind of jumped pit, ship. And what was the idea here? Right? Obedience. Obey. That's the theme in Jonah. Now, Peter mentions Noah. And if you don't know this story, very quickly to recall it. So again, uh, God, Genesis 6, God's displeased with the whole world. It, it, the angels or sons of God are procreating with the daughters of men. They're corrupt, it says. It lets us know they're corrupt. But Noah is walking with God. He's not corrupt. He's blameless, right? So he's called to make this ark, right? So him and his family, Shem, Ham, Japheth, his sons and their wives and his wife, they all get on the boat. That's it, right? And probably like 14-ish of every animal. Okay, read it. Read it. <laughs> and it doesn't say anything about any fish on the ark. It's interesting. Read it carefully for yourself. Interesting. So anyway, obedience carries him safely on the ship. Think about it. You know, we've seen movies and parodies about this thing. Like, you're crazy building this ark, right? And speculation doesn't really say anything. But really? I want to build this ark? Like, why? I'm going to flood the world. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? But I'll do it. Obedient. He was a man of obedience, 
I'm not going to question it. Right? So the movies get it totally wrong about Noah. He was obedient. wasn't crying about it. Didn't question it. No, he just did it. And that's the point of the story. So this image Peter brings to mind through Noah, if you know the story, right? It automatically, like an idiom or something we'd use today, it would make us think, cause us to think of being carried away to safety, right? staying on this vessel. So some questions, putting this all together that we need to ask ourselves. If we boarded the ark, what might cause us to abandon it? What might cause us to jump ship if we're being carried to safety? And we know that. Sin. Would sin cause us to jump ship? See, here it has consequences. Would, would that cause us to, to jump ship? Something sinful, something we desire that we know just isn't good, but we're just, we're going to jump overboard and uh-oh. Right? And it's worse, never better. Out of the pan, out of the fire. Remember, the devil prowls around like a lion, looking, waiting for you to mess up. All right? He's the tempter. But what does it say about us? We are holy. We're set apart from that. That's not what we do. All right? You know, it kind of gets interesting here because I, I see this dynamic a lot in church, you know, and the Bible talks a lot about, you know, if you read the Proverbs, like the seductress, the adulteress, talks a lot about that kind of thing, you know. Uh, there's a big concern about women being to, able to take away. Even Paul, like, you know, uh, concentrate on the Lord, right? So it, it's interesting. I've seen this, being a pastor, I've seen this in church. Will, uh, you know, a woman or a man, will someone seduce us away from our godly marriage or a godly partner? Will that happen? Can we get seduced away from the faith? And I look at also different kinds of marriages. When people get married, like someone will be in the church and be married and all into it. And it's okay if you want to marry someone with a different faith, but if you're already a Christian, it's not advisable. Even in the Bible, it's not advisable, right? So when he's talk, Paul's talking about that in 1 Corinthians 7, it's like we weren't Christians and then we came to Christ. One of us came to Christ and one didn't, right? So then you can win that spouse over with your godly behavior, but be careful, like joining yourselves in union, right? You're one flesh now with someone who's not a Christian. You're going to have problems. And I've seen this happen where people kind of get, like, seduced away from the church. But what have we learned? Like, a lot of people think church isn't important. Let, let, let stop. You know, oh, and I, can, I can just be a Christian, like, army of one Christian, right? Because I don't, I don't need the body of Christ. Okay. You must be awesome, Right? No, I don't need that. They downplay church. I want you to think about something. Paul, 13 letters of the New Testament, 27. Where are his letters written to? The church. And leaders of the church. Ah, uh, kind of important, isn't it? Most of the context here is the church. It's called the body of Christ, right? So if you're not a part of the body of Christ, you are, are apart from the body of Christ. It's important. And so I've seen people seduced away from, by one body, from the body of Christ. You know, and it starts out slow. Like, they start dating and like, yeah, I'll come to your church, you know, that kind of thing. That's how they sound. <laughs> you know, they start, and it starts slow. But, you know, just one Sunday. No. Just one hit. Just one hit. Okay. And then they like come once in a while, and then all of a sudden, well, you know, we have this on Sundays. We have that on Sundays. She likes to do this on Sundays. Oh, I know she does. I warned you about that. And now you're apart from the body of Christ. It's important. Being a part of this is literally crucial to Christianity. And by the way, if you've been with us for a while, you know this. It's commanded in the Word of God. Read Hebrews 10. It's commanded. You are commanded to be a part of a church. What is it? Who, who do we love, Peter says? Like the family of believers, your brothers and sisters in Christ. How do you do that when you don't, you're not around them ever? What did Jesus say about his body? Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. What happens to the goats? Well, when did we see you? Hungry, thirsty, naked, and prisoner, and sick. When, uh, that which you did to the least of these, my brothers. Who's that? You. What happens to the goats that didn't care for Jesus' body, <laughs> out of the pan, into the fire. 
I see a lot of people jump ship on like their godly missions as well, right? What they're supposed to be doing. You know, they have other things taking them away from the body of Christ. It happens all the time. You know, a big question on Sundays is like, does your boss know you're a Christian? Kind of important, right? Isn't that how you witness? What does it say about the employer's employees? How are you, do, how are you doing with that if he doesn't know you're a Christian or she or whatever? And so you say, what do I do? I'm a Christian traditionally forever and ever. Like, this is the Lord's day. I need to go to church. I can work after church, right? Yeah, yeah. It's important, right? Well, your friends, right, cause you to jump ship. We've talked about toxic relationships. There's part in my life where I was just like, I cannot hang out with you guys anymore. I don't want to do it. And sure enough, ooh, you're a Christian now, right? And then, ooh, you're a pastor now. Ooh. Their lives are a wreck. And now I'm like, you want to get on. Right? God's being patient with them, and I know that. Come on. <laughs> Come aboard, right? But are you going to go the other way? Are you going to be like, yeah, you know, let's party or do whatever it is you're not supposed to be doing? Right? So sometimes that happens, right? They'll be there drowning. And you got to be careful. You throw them a life raft, right? But sometimes when you reach down, they'll pull you in. You have to be careful, right? This could go two hours if you keep encouraging me. Just like, <laughs> people who are not new here are like, <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's very encouraging. Thank you. <laughs> I can't not joke. I just, I can't not joke. I'm so sorry. Right? So, they're, again, they're laughing at you from this sinking ship. Right? They're headed for this, like, waterfall. And you're fine in your ark. Stay in it. Stay in it. Don't engage. The fiery trials. Or the fiery trials. Something you're going through right now. Convincing you that this is no good. Right? This isn't working. But you're being refined. Think about it, right? If you're sitting here today, you're alive, I hope. And, right? And so you've been through stuff, right? Everybody, everybody's been through stuff. And at the time, you thought, like, this is the end. You know what I mean? This is like the, remember some of the stuff as a kid, right? They took your toy away. You're like, ah! You know what I mean? The end of the world. You made it. And then something happened in high school. Somebody broke up with you. Right? You wanted to kill yourself. You made it. You're just fine. Maybe you even found a better spouse. <laughs> you made it. Okay, don't play the tape. All right, so anyway. <laughs> so careful right now. Anyway. <laughs> you made it. And this too shall pass. Right? So that was a different reference. I couldn't help it. But you can amen that. <laughs> right? You're here, and you're going to be there. And even if you're not, it doesn't matter. See you in heaven. It's all good. That's, and that's, believe me, a whole lot better than this on its best day. That's it. They refine us. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through. And this is the bad thing. Like when, when pastors don't read this to their church, then people are surprised. And you know what happens? They fall away from the faith. So by hiding the truth from people, you're dooming them. That's not good. It's called a bait and switch, people. Fine print. There's no fine print in the Word of God unless you have a six-point font Bible. That's fine. That technically is. But you know what I'm saying, right? Instead, be very glad. These trials, they refine you, and they make you partners with Christ. Let's go. They're a good thing when we look at them rightly. The false teachings. Where Peter ends up, probably where I'll end up here. Will false teachings cause you to jump ship? Think about it. The prosperity gospel, I call it the perishable gospel. It's without refinement. Where's the refinement? Right? It's kind of like going to the gym and not doing anything. So you say you're going to the gym, right? But it doesn't look like it, right? So... But you're not doing anything. You're not putting in any work. And there are so many, I would dare to say, the majority of Christians out there going to the spiritual gym. They're saying they're Christians, but they're not putting in any work. And you can see it. And you can see it. It's obvious by their behavior. When they're slandering others, repaying insult for insult. What's, you're not going to, you're not refined. So it's important. And so there's a gospel out there that tells you, this is it, man. 
This is it. Like, you just want to get as much of this stuff as possible because a man of God, what? Maybe you should have a lot of stuff. No, that's not what it says. All right? Man of God, Elisha, gave up the money Naaman wanted to give him. He was a wicked servant. We looked at this Gehazi. was cursed with Naaman's leprosy because he took the money. That's a man of God. First Timothy, what does it say? Oh, man of God, flee from these worldly things. That's a man of God. Right? We should be refining ourselves and trying to learn to live with less and prepare ourselves. For the new heaven and the new earth, not this one. But there's a gospel that tells you exactly the, op the opposite, and I call it the perishable gospel, the half of gospel. God will bless us, but it's not the main concern here, right? It's just a foreshadowing of other blessings. And so you hear the truth, and I really hope that you've heard the truth today. You've heard what some consider a large portion of God's word, but in the early church, this is nothing. They were just... Read these letters aloud as they're commanded to do. But I hope it's obvious to you. I hope it's causing healing where there was some error and, and some encouragement. Again, what does Peter say about the grass and the flower in the field? It withers. This, we read today, that's the only one and true gospel. That's it. There's not another one. And I just read it to you. Right? Important. Remember, we need to be focused on the horizon, on the heavenly things. If you've been with us for a few weeks, that's what we were talking about, right? That Hebrews 2 thing. We need to set our sights on Jesus. No matter what illustration you want to give, that's what we need to focus on. There's going to be a lot of noise, a lot of mess going on in your lives. I know it's there. That's fine. But it's just refining trials, just refining trials. That's fine. That's fine. We're in the gym, right? We don't want to do another rep, another set, or whatever. To be. Just do it. It's going to pay off. Let's go. That's fine. Bring it. You know, build ourselves up in Christ. Remember something like we are being, that, that illustration of that ark being carried somewhere. And think about Peter, the human author of these letters. Think about Peter. What happened with Peter? He left an earthly vessel. And what was he being carried on the water with? His faith in Christ. Peter walked on water through his faith in Jesus. When did he sink? When he started worrying about the things of this world. So as Jesus said, like, look, the wind and the waves are going to batter you. They're going to slam against you. The storms are going to come. But if you are built on the bedrock of Christ, you're fine. You've built on a solid foundation. And so that's my encouragement for you today. I'd like to end with just a couple pieces of scripture. I'm just going to kind of pray from the scripture for you. His words, again, better than mine. So, there's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Jesus Christ. So after you've suffered for a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen.